Hello, this is Dr. Scott Catino, and I've put together a very short video lecture on the subject of primary sources. This is entitled Primary Sources, Why They Are Essential for Security Studies. And this is certainly the case at Henley Putnam University, as many students are undertaking their theses or their dissertations. This subject is, is pretty important to understand. Obviously, the research that you do is going to be no better than the sources that are used, which would indeed be the basis of your information. And primary sources, I would assert here, are absolutely essential for your research and for the quality of your research. And in the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, I would like to go over why that is the case uh, through this video lecture here, bringing out some of the key points. So what is the purpose? The purpose of this presentation is to underscore, as I've noted, the importance of using primary sources in security studies. Really without the use of the primary sources, the students who are studying security or researcher cannot adequately gain the depth, the perspective, fairness, or accuracy of the subject. If you really are achieving or striving, I should say, to achieve quality in your research, it is essential for uh, using primary sources. Now, obviously, this is going to vary by subject. When we're dealing with security studies and we're dealing with groups like Al Qaeda or some terrorist group, may it be the Lord's Resistance Army, or perhaps you're studying Hezbollah, or particularly Hezbollah activities in a specific area like the tri border area, or even a little closer to home on the US. Mexico border. Some of these areas and issues are so highly sensitive, access to a primary source, an individual that has actually seen or recorded the event or the effects, uh, this could be highly classified information that simply is not readily available. But that being said, in this era that we live in, in this era of globalization where it's so easy to take out a, a cell phone and video an event, it's less and less likely that activities, no matter how nefarious or related to security they may be, uh, could be hidden or would evade the division of the, the population. So again, it's going to vary by your subject. And my point here of emphasis is to use these primary sources to create the accuracy and depth and perspective that are so necessary for quality. Well, what is a primary source? I will have students ask me what particularly comprises or constitutes a primary source. And this definition here from Yale University's website on primary sources succinctly captures what a primary source involves. I think if you take a moment to look this over, you'll see that a primary source differs from a secondary source and that the primary source was actually witnessed. It's a testimony or direct evidence concerning your topic, your subject. Someone actually saw it, wrote about it, recorded it at the time or later. It was an eyewitness to the event or to an effect that took place, a condition occurring. And therefore, these primary sources are so critical to access and to look at because of the fact of the unique perspective that is involved. Again, please take a moment to look over this definition and think about this and think about the possibilities of exploring primary sources. Here is just some of the basic reasons why primary sources are so essential. First of all, primary sources allow access to the unique and expert perspectives, thoughts, and issues of individual leaders, players, and groups shaping the security environment. And I use here a recent example, the 2014, this year's uh, Crimean crisis that's taking place. Here I have two key players from, obviously, uh, Vladimir Putin from Russia and the Prime Minister of the Ukraine. Uh, these are obviously key players in their thoughts, their speeches that they give, their testimonies, what they're writing down, what they're giving to the press what has been recorded at a speech, either officially or unofficially, is going to reveal their perspectives, their thoughts, um, oftentimes their intentions. And this may vary indeed by the audience, the time that it's given, and, and that need not be a reason to exclude primary sources. Because even if 
for a particular audience, let's say Vladimir Putin is speaking for no other purpose than to give propaganda, then that perspective and the time, the event, the audience, that should all be measured as a critical aspect of your research. If you find that Vladimir Putin is speaking very uh, differently in the Duma, their parliament, uh, than he is to the uh, Western press, then those kinds of pieces of information and the variants should be aptly noted and tied in with other sources in order to create the perspective and the comprehensiveness that we strive for in research. To simply dismiss these perspectives as being biased because they're the individuals actually shaping and participating in the event really is erroneous because oftentimes the intentions, the ideas, the audiences that are being addressed are all critical pieces of information for understanding a security event. It's very, very important. Second, primary sources allow researchers to fairly and accurately analyze leaders, issues, and events shaping the security environment. And let me note, even if it's a group as odious, as disgusting, and as revolting as the worst terrorist group you could think of, I have a picture here of the leadership of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Even if it's a group that obviously is moving under the most hateful motives and intentions, or obviously using propaganda, again, the fairness of our research demands that we, at the very least, go to the sources to understand their perspective. And that would mean that we should then soften the ethical standards which guide our research. That's not the point. But the point is, all research should have a very strong element and ethic involved. One principle, that is to analyze fairly all subjects by allowing them to speak as if it were a court trial, allowing a group's position to be understood by fully examining it. To simply take a secondary source at its face value, even if it appears to be obvious, still misses a point of either fairness or accuracy. It's critical to look at these sources and to fairly and accurately analyze them. And primary sources are essential for that end. Next slide. Primary sources also allow access to the ground level perspectives, the very human domain perspective that's essential for understanding the context, the environment, and the effects. And I have a quote here from an excellent book that discuss the DTOs, the drug trafficking organizations, um, called El Narco. And this particular excerpt, I could have picked one of many, just jumped out to me. I was reading over this again, or reading it recently. And what an extraordinary example here, where the author is able to go into an area where drug trafficking is thriving and examine the local population as he interviews or in essence is uh, gaining information by interacting and talking and interviewing I should say the local population uh, the poppies are beautiful aren't they she says uh, a local as she sees me the author he he states admiring her flowers where did she get the seeds for opium I ask from her brother she tells me adding that this is a village of valientes or brave ones the term mountain folk used for drug traffickers the men who pulled this community out of poverty end quote now the point that's being brought out here in this source even though it's a secondary source it, it contains a primary source within it here this woman is very clearly showing the effects of a drug trafficking organizations propaganda messaging and influencing operations in the local area and here we find that this local perspective, at least of this person, and it matches many others, do not view these narco-terrorists as terrorists and horrible killers and murderers and criminals, but they look at them as being brave. They look at them as being individuals that transform the local community from one of poverty, at least to a higher level, um, or, or took them out of poverty, I should say, to a, certainly to a higher level, perhaps even one of relative prosperity in the region. That perspective is critical to understand. And without using primary sources, that perspective will be lost. And a major part of studying the security environment will be lost. So again, it's very important to look at primary sources 
as a major aspect of security studies. Primary sources allow access to opponent thought processes, decision making, perspectives, and value systems. It is very important when we understand enemy, that is to say hostile leadership, that we look at the speeches, we look at the statements being made, we look at the books that they have written and begin to understand what motivates them, their intentions, what their worldview may be, what master narratives are being manipulated and created to affect the local population. And here I just have, again, one of many statements by uh, some, Osama bin Laden here talking about the importance of hostility and hatred in the jihad. And again, we get a look into his value system, his perspective, and certainly the motivation that was a major part of his life and that animates Al-Qaeda to this day. Very important. Using primary sources to understand a key terrain that is often overlooked, the psychological terrain, which is critical for security studies. Without the use of these primary sources, it is very difficult to delve that deeply and to ascertain these critical variables shaping the security environment. Primary sources allow access to information that reveals the level of intensity of a group, an individual, or an issue. And again, I, I want primary sources to be viewed at not just simply something you're going to find in a memoir or a speech, but even something like graffiti that may be visible in a conflict zone, an area of unrest is critical to understand. And I, I use this example here. I have a picture that I took recently while I was in Bahrain studying the unrest that's taking place in that island monarchy. You know, it's interesting when you look at all the literature taking place, uh, rather all the literature, all the reporting, all the information that comes out, and it can be overwhelming. And even if so much of the information is true, you lose a sense of intensity or weight of an issue unless you're actually able to evaluate some of these primary sources. In this case, we had a chance to go throughout the island and, and study the graffiti, and this one in particular, which was relatively typical, showed the level of intensity and hatred, again, taking place in the unrest among the, the Shia militants and the terrorism that's taking place on that island. Here, uh, the statement is, Hamad is killed. Really, what they're saying is King Hamad should be killed. Interestingly enough, within that very village where this was taken, uh, right about the time, I would say a week before we took this, this picture of that graffiti, uh, three policemen were attacked and two were killed in that very village. And we're able to use this information to understand why, why that area why that area is such a violent attack on the local police when they came into the area to secure the area. Well, it's obvious the local population um, has been whipped into a high state of antipathy towards the government, and so much of that anger is being channeled toward the, to, towards the uh, local police. So again, using these sources to not just understand truth or to gain some accuracy, because you can have all kinds of information, but to put weight on some pieces of information over others and to determine intensity. Without using primary sources, that's very difficult to do. And oftentimes a student gets lost in a sea of information and is not able to understand the big issues from the smaller issues and weigh evidence. Primary sources are critical for doing that and making those kinds of deeper evaluations. Okay, let's move along. Primary sources allow access to time as a variable, the timing, phasing, and sequencing of operations, both as a tactic and a characteristic of a group. So much of this information is sensitive. I wanted to go back in history and look at Leon Trotsky, for instance, a, a model communist insurgent. And we see here how his tactics are laid out from a perspective of timing and what variables constitute times for action. When you look at some of the primary sources, you're able to even gain this type of depth where an opponent, so a hostile in a security environment, will actually reveal the stages of operations, the phasing that can or will take place. And therefore, even something as nuanced as timing, where time is a variable in a security environment, which is very difficult to assess, at times can be found 
in these types of primary sources if you look deeply enough and carefully enough and thoroughly enough. Primary sources, when accessed correctly, can minimize the politicizing bias, the arbitrary judgments and inaccuracies that are often found in secondary sources. Now, let me qualify that. What is a secondary source? It's written after the fact. It's written by someone who may have an expert opinion, uh, who did not witness the event, did not partake of it, but is analyzing it, commenting on it, and offering an explanation of it. It constitutes a large body of evidence, and oftentimes, with the passing of time, with cool reflection, with the addition of time and added information, a higher degree of accuracy can be achieved. Thus, we have secondary sources. Thus, we use the works of great scholars who write on subjects. And this, is, this can be the case. Or it cannot be. It could be that with the passing of time, critical information is lost. It could be with the passing of time or within the distance created by a secondary source, a person who wasn't an observer, an individual is recycling misinformation. And this is often the case. And we so easily reverse the type of logic that's necessary for finding truth. We often say, well, participants in firsthand accounts are biased. And they can be. And then secondary sources are more accurate. This may not be the case. The fact is there could be bias in both accounts. So t to dismiss primary sources as being biased or even secondary sources is wrong. They both have to be used and evaluated for accuracy. So using primary sources as a starting point, as a way to gain depth and accuracy, is certainly what's critical in high quality research. And then perhaps you will be more able then to evaluate so many of the secondary sources and be able to evaluate which ones have higher quality and are more useful for your research. Types of commonly used primary sources, and this list certainly isn't inclusive, deals with speeches, interviews, statements, newspapers, and pamphlets, government documents, particularly declassified documents, and now we have so much of that. We use so many websites from the, even including the CIA, um, our, any, of, any of our major agencies, Department of Defense, Department of Army simply declassifying a lot of documents, which allows us to gain insights, even some that are, are, are relatively new, which allows us to study the security environment, maps, videos. Let's not rule out social media, blogs, Twitter, um, certainly using YouTube. Any type of audio or visual could constitute a critical primary source. And oftentimes, these are the more revealing. Graffiti, as I have shown. Uh, not taken as an isolated piece of information, but tied in with others. There are scholars that have done extraordinary jobs looking at music, poems, and other literature. And there are, let me just add here, since we're on this subject, there are many people in the field of counterinsurgency that believe that you cannot truly understand the sociocultural terrain and major perspectives, the hearts and the minds of a population without understanding their literature their values, beliefs, behaviors, and norms. These are all critical parts of your research and should be, and obviously field notes if you're able to find notes from someone who has conducted firsthand research. Even raw notes can be very valuable. And many of these primary sources, I may add, are found in our very own Henley Putnam Virtual Library. Again, I, I want to note that you know access to primary sources it's going to vary by subject, by group, or by location. Some subjects obviously have quite a bit of this. Others, the information primary source, it will be far more scant. It will be scant, I should say. So that needs to be kept in mind. There are certain subjects there just isn't a lot of primary source material. So what are my conclusions here and recommendations? Primary sources should excuse me, be a major part of student research papers, theses, and dissertations at Henley Putnam University. Primary sources allow the student to gain accuracy, perspective, scope, and depth, among other qualities sought in research. Primary sources are often overlooked, causing research in the security field to be faulty, to be skewed, really, and even to be biased. Primary sources 
what is often used today as open source information, and that's processed, it can become open source intelligence, are commonly used in the intelligence and security research fields, and therefore it's important to understand it as it's something that is commonly used and it's expected if you're going to be in the research field. You will have not only understand how to use these materials, but you will have used them in your research. So it's important to get on that sooner rather than later. Thank you very much for viewing this video lecture. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me here at my email. And have a great week.